Welcome to the Saving Stormwater podcast. I have a great guest for us today, but before we get started, this podcast is made possible by Compliance Go. Compliance Go is a fully customizable stormwater inspection software designed to help your team avoid stormwater fines. From recording inspections on your phone or tablet to mapping out your project, Compliance Go is equipped to help stormwater managers in every sector. Compliance Go gives you the most software for your dollar, regardless of if you are in construction, industrial, municipal, or long-term stormwater work. Check them out at the link in the podcast description to get started with your first project, Free for Life. Okay, today we are going to take a slightly different approach to the podcast. Uh, we're focusing on a specific permit today, so the state of Florida's NPDES generic permit for construction activities. To help me better understand the ins and outs of this permit, I am joined by Cheryl Moore. Hi, Cheryl. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your job experience, what you do, um, and how you're saving stormwater. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I, I've, uh, I've been teaching uh, for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Um, they have a stormwater erosion and sedimentation control inspector training program. Uh, so I've been teaching that since it was released in 1999. Uh, I also teach for the Florida Stormwater Association. They have a um, level one and level two stormwater operators program where we focus on the MS4 uh, permit requirements, you know, for the cities and counties. And I've been their primary trainer for the last 12 years. Uh, I've owned and operated my own consulting business for the past 15 years. And uh, at this point, it's mostly doing training. I mean, sometimes I, I conduct quality control site inspections, but mostly training. Wonderful. Yeah, we, we always need somebody to help us out with understanding these permits. So it's it's always good to have somebody that can help break it down for us. So well, that's what I try to do. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did you always want to get into stormwater? I mean, that's that's kind of been the recurring theme with everybody I've talked to is that it wasn't something they planned to get into. They just sort of fell into it. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to say that I've, I've dreamed of doing this, you know, since I was in my uh, early teens, but no, that's, no, it, it was, it wasn't really falling into stormwater. It was, it was more like being thrown into stormwater. Sure. Um, when the DEP program um, was introduced, uh, there were no trainers. Uh, the only trainers were the two people that had put it together uh, up in Tallahassee. So, um, so they called on those of us in the industry who wanted to, you know, more or less volunteer our services to conduct portions of the training program. So um, at that time, I was working for a manufacturer's representative uh, for stormwater erosion and sedimentation control, um, different types of engineer design, you know, products and materials. So, and I was doing all the marketing for them. So basically I went from conducting one hour, like lunch and learn presentations for engineering firms and, you know, government agencies to teaching a day to a, a day and a half um, class on, you know, the entire certification program, more or less, on my own. Mm. Okay. So I, uh, I think you can help us out a little bit since we are focusing on the uh, Florida generic construction permit. Um, what are just some kind of common questions, misconceptions that uh, you get to hear about in some of your trainings? Okay, well, um, probably the probably the biggest problem is that um, that nobody's read it, you know. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so that so that makes it challenging. I mean, you know, it's it's really it's not not you know a, a permit that you want to you know curl up with and <laughs> and and read for enjoyment or anything. So, um, but I mean, there has been some major changes to the permit uh, because um, before 2015. Um, it was uh, it was very different, and it was about 12 pages long. It's it's now more than doubled in size. But I was really happy when they when they did the revision, because now it's in plain English format. 
<clears throat> which means that you don't have to hire an attorney to figure out what it is that they're talking about anymore. So <laughs> that's a good thing. It, you know, it's pretty much straightforward. Um, but I mean, but from, from the very beginning and just, I mean, even still some of the wording, I think that a lot of people get confused on. Um, they define construction activity, first of all, and I don't know about you and most people, you know, typically when you think of a construction project, you think, oh, they're, you know, they're going to build something. They're going to build um, the, uh, a roadway. They're building a highway interchange. They're building a, a shopping mall or a, a housing development, but not according to the permit. I mean, according to the permit, it says specifically any land disturbance of one acre or more, any, I mean, just clearing vegetation of mm. one acre or more, um, or even if it's less than an acre and it's part of the common plan of sale or development that will eventually disturb an acre. Um, so, I mean, there, there's like, there's, there's so many different uh, perspectives or viewpoints that people take on this. So, okay. So one or more acre, um, basically, let's just go with that. So even if a contractor is laying pipe, and their trenches, however many feet wide and however many feet long, and it equates to 43,560 square feet, that's in an acre, they are, they're, they're supposed to apply for permit coverage. Um, the smaller than an acre, um, so it says smaller than an acre and part of common plan of sale or development that will eventually disturb an acre. So mm -hmm. that means if a home builder um, let's say, uh, you know, a big home builder, they come in and they have all the infrastructure put in and they start building houses, but then, but then they're nice enough to sell some of the lots to other builders so that they can build in the subdivision too. Um, it, it doesn't matter if the home builder that comes in is building on one of those quarter acre or half acre lots or more than one that would equate to more than an acre uh, under the permit. It, that is defined as part of the common plan of sale or development. And yes, a permit would need to be um, obtained or, well, you're not, that's something else that that's a lot of people get confused on because I have contractors say, Hey, we filed a notice of intent and we got the letter back from DEP saying that, um, okay, so here's your permit reference number, but they didn't send us a permit. Mm. Well, you're not applying for a permit. <laughs> You're applying for coverage under a permit that DEP created and said, this is going to be the same as that permit for every single project, which is why I decided, I guess they decided to name it generic, which was, you know, a good name for that. But you know, I'm like, no, sure. you have to download the permit. <laughs> you're, you're, right. you're, you've applied for coverage under the permit. So, um, so, I mean, that, that's sometimes an issue. Um, Another another problem that I see is, um, okay, and this was a change in 2015. Um, the verbiage says that the contractor has seven calendar days to send a copy of the notice of intent that has been filed with DEP or the uh, reference letter that they get back from DEP showing that they received the notice of intent. Um, they're, the contractors are supposed, they have seven calendar days. They're supposed to send a copy of one or the other to the local municipality. I mean, whoever's, you know, it could be the OT, the mm -hmm. city of Tampa, Hillsborough County. I mean, whoever's drainage system that they have the potential of impacting. And I'm, you know, I'm not hearing a lot of that going on because I work a lot with the government people too. Um, but that's what the contractor's supposed to do. And a lot of them are kind of caught off guard by that. Because they didn't know they were supposed to do that. Right, that makes sense. So, what what happens if they they don't send it in within a week? Uh, well, unfortunately, I mean, enforcement is kind of splotchy. It really depends mm -hmm. on what area that you're in, because you know some municipalities they have very proactive enforcement programs, whereas others they're still working on their inventory, you know, and they haven't even sure. developed, you know, specific ordinances. So, you know, it, it might be something that you could get away with if you were in Arcadia or someplace else, you know, right. <laughs> in the middle of Florida that nobody ever goes anyway, except I guess the people that live there that, um, you know, versus if it's a project in Pinellas County, that's going to get, you know, a lot more attention. I don't know that any contractors ever been fined per se though, you know, for not, 
um, for not giving a copy to the local municipality because part of that as well uh, or part of the notice of intent or the receipt letter from DEP, the permit says that it is supposed to be um, put in a place for public viewing. So guaranteed, like Pinellas County, for example, they would they have their own construction inspection program, as do all other MS4 permit holders. So if they didn't receive a copy from the contractor, they're just going to go out to the website or to their job site and, you know, see if it's posted in the permit box or, you know, somewhere. It should be posted somewhere at the job site entrance. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. So what about what about inspections? What because I've heard there's a lot of, of inspections and there's differences between every state in terms of, you know, what they're required to do. And, you know, but sometimes there's, you know, you need to do an inspection sometimes after there's rain events. Uh, sometimes right. you need to do more things if there is a rain event or something's happening on the project based off of rain events. Can you speak a little bit to that? Okay. And well, that's something else that some people get confused about um, as to the way the permit is written because it's written and I mean don't quote me on this because I don't have it in front of me but it says that inspections should be done a minimum of every seven calendar days and after every half inch or greater rain event so you can you can kind of view that actually a couple of ways Okay, so a minimum of every seven calendar days. Does that mean that if I did my weekly inspection on Friday and then it rained more than half of an inch on Wednesday? So I went out there and I did my rain event inspection on Wednesday. Um, technically, wouldn't my next inspection, I mean, if it doesn't rain again for a whole week, be due on the following Wednesday instead of the following Friday? Mm. So some, some people think that that's the case, but I have clarified that with DEP and they said, no, no, it is weekly and after every half inch or greater rain event. Mm -hmm. So I usually tell the contractors, you know, do, do your, your weekly inspection on Friday or whatever your favorite day of the week is, and then do the rain event inspections in addition to the weekly inspections. Um, that was something that I was really happy to see um, a change on in the, the permit uh, wording because um, what, what it used to say was, um, okay, so after every half inch or greater rain event, uh, weekly inspections, and after every half, uh, half inch or greater rain event. So um, I'd commonly get the question from students, um, so when is the end of a rain event? Because, you know, especially in Florida, <laughs> it yeah. can rain on and off really hard all, all day. So, uh, or maybe even a couple of days in a row. So DEP defined the end of a rain event for us when it has rained, when it has, when it has stopped raining for four hours, that's what's considered to be the end of a rain event. And that is when um, the 24 hour clock starts ticking for the contractor to get out there to conduct that rain event inspection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also tell the contractors what you don't want to do is in between rain events is run out there and qu quickly reset the rain gauge because um, it's also 24 hours of rain accumulation in the rain gauge and then the rain stops for four hours and then you've got 24 hours to get out there mm. to do your inspection. I mean, I know some other states, I mean, even some other companies here in Florida, they're still operating under the EPA guidelines of every quarter of an inch, but in Florida, it does rain so much, they decide to give us a little bit of, uh, of a break. So it's every mm -hmm. half inch or greater for us. That's good. So 24 so hour timeline for the inspections after rain event, um, any deficiencies? that are found, uh, inlet protection devices that aren't working, silt fences down, excessive erosion, you know, whatever that is. Um, there's a seven calendar day rule for uh, the contractor to uh, actually uh, fix any of those problems. So uh, uh, corrective actions have to be conducted within seven days of finding a problem. And then also our permit says that temporary covers are required uh, so if there's an area that the contractor has temporarily or stopped working on, mm -hmm. uh, they have seven calendar days to get that area covered up 
with something. It could be plastic, temporary seed, mulch, but they're, they are supposed to cover those areas up with something within, you know, that week time frame. Okay. So this next part's kind of a sticky subject, but what, what happens if they don't? What happens if they say, eh, you know what, I'm, I'm doing a project that's 1.1 acres. You know, there's no way that the FDEP is going to, is going to figure out what's going on here. What, what happens if, something like that happens, what happens if these misconceptions um, turn into a failure to comply? Oh, well, depending. Um, <laughs> uh, a contractor could actually get in trouble with a number of different organizations. Um, I mean, cities and counties under their construction inspection program, I mean, they, they could find a, find a contractor. I mean, I know certain very proactive um, cities and counties that will, um, they'll issue a $10,000 a day um, fine. I mean, just immediately for those deficiencies. Um, uh, At a state level, it's currently over $52,000. And well, actually the DEP has what's called a matrix of fines. So, uh, and it's public information. You can Google search it. Uh, so that their matrix of fines is a points value system. So they have a checklist of things that they're going to look for. And obviously, the more points, the more things that you have wrong, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the more points that add up, <laughs> the higher the fine is going to be. So is that, ten th- is that $10,000 per day? Is that like a, a starting fee or is that like a... What, uh, I would say that that would be a starting point for most. I mean, like I said, it, it can vary depending upon um, whose jurisdiction that you're working in, because th- right. that's something that's not set in stone with the municipalities. Um, they they have their own, each MS4 permit is their own agreement with DEP as to how they're going to handle things, but they, they do all have to have a construction inspection program. Whether or not they have the ammunition to implement fines, some do and some don't. Um, some mm-hmm. some do have the capability of issuing stop work orders without fining, but a stop wow. work order, I mean, that's still going to cost you money. So, yeah. um, right. Well, so, I can see how that would be a lot more than $10,000 too. Exactly. And I mean, in talking with the EP, you know, they've, they've told me that they try to, you know, if they find something wrong, unless it's just a horrible, horrible, like blatant non-compliance issue, you know, they will try to somewhat, you know, partner uh, with the contractor and, you know, correcting the situation. Um, but the Environmental Protection Agency at federal level, uh, they do their own inspections anytime they want to, you know, wherever they want to. So according to DEP, if EPA finds something wrong on a project site, um, they'll put like two or three more zeros on the end of what a state fine is. Oof. I mean, I, I heard where EPA find a contractor ten thousand dollars for having a broken stake on their silt fence they called it lack of maintenance which which seems very unreasonable to me but yeah me too. You know, i mean i guess if you're the federal government you can you can do things like that um yeah and we have a lot of water bodies in florida too so um if it's a fish kill because of turbidity um i mean or or impact in a wetland the uh, water management districts can get involved uh, the Army Corps of Engineers could get involved. Um, uh, they have ammunition to fine. Uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, I mean, they, they, they're certainly going to come out if there's a fish kill. And they have the ammunition to fine, you know, as well. So so technically, I guess, if it's really bad, you know, fines could, um, they could kind of stack up. <laughs> I yeah. mean, pro- they, they might be close to, I, it's not unheard of, of a million dollar fine. Um, so, and I do know some organizations who've, you know, had some pretty big fines like that. Right. Well, I, in my experience, it doesn't sound like there's a lot of people who are just trying to get away with things, but more, it's just hard to understand the, the, the generic construction permit because it's so complex. And, you know, like you said, they just doubled the size of it from 15 to 30 pages. Like, so do you have, do you have any experience with, people being able to avoid these fines and people being able to be proactive with stormwater pollution? Um, Yes. And well, mostly it's those organizations who've already been in trouble 
you know, sadly enough, <laughs> mm-hmm. that have decided to develop their own in-house, you know, training program. But, um, I mean, I do know that many contractors have jumped on board uh, with in-house training, you know, because, because they don't want to be fine and they've seen others in their same industry that, that have been. So, um, so in-house training programs, um, uh, for example, um, uh, Walmart, Home Depot, um, uh, a number of the home builders that I know, uh, they've developed like a four-hour training video that mm-hmm. um, anybody that comes out to do any work at all on their site, they have to sit through the the training first uh, to make sure that they understand you know proper disposal and materials and using a concrete washout area or you know just basically you know reporting spills of certain substances. So I mean, all, and all that's outlined in the stormwater pollution prevention plan. But you know, taking it to the next level and educating all of those people on site, like the subcontractors who who honestly have never heard of stormwater regulations at all. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem is that they don't, they don't care either. (laughs) So, so that, that can make it challenging, but, you know, educating, just, yeah, educating those people um, can really help out. So, I mean, I think that, I think the in-house programs that I've seen, I mean, I know some have developed like special, um, uh, special brochures or uh, like one page mailers that they send out to the president of the concrete company, you know, saying, you know, having them sign off that their people will agree to use the washout area provided or, uh, or, or even like portalettes, um, recommending the use of biodegradable products instead of ammonia and chlorine. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that I've seen. I, I think that, you know, overall the idea is, the more that you can um, educate uh, those workers on site and the more that you can hold them accountable for, you know, <clears throat> making a mess on the mm-hmm. site and requiring them to clean it up, then then the better the program <laughs> is going to work. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thought. And I'm, I hope a, a few people do take that into consideration if they get to hear this. So um, we were talking a little bit before the podcast and um, – You've been in Florida for quite a while. Um, what has, you know, what's changed in terms of um, environmental quality? You know, um, I, I think you, I, I, I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like you've been in uh, Florida working on the uh, stormwater related information almost since it started to become a, a real thing in Florida. Yes, that, that that's correct. And, um, well, and, you know, there, there is a passion there because I grew up in Florida and actually I'm, um, at least on my mom's side, I'm seven generation Floridian on my father's side. I'm very British and very Canadian. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yes, I mean, well, we had, well, my sister and I still own it, but, um, uh, 10 acres, all lakefront property uh, up in the Orlando area uh, near an area called Clearmont. But when I grew up there, I mean, I remember the lake was crystal clear. It was, it was spring fed. Um, I mean, the lake is still there, but, uh, and I used to swim in it when I was growing up with my sister and cousins, but I mean, I, I wouldn't step foot in it today. I mean, my, my, my kids, my daughters never had the opportunity to swim in that lake because they put a big subdivision across the way and then there was septic discharge. So, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say that, um, after the clean water act was passed or implemented in 1970, uh, water quality overall, it appeared to be getting better. Um, but now, uh, we have more development and more people and then of course more pollution as a result. So, um, you know, basically we're, we're really challenged at this point in finding a way to protect, you know, our, our water bodies here. And right. most of the water bodies in the state of Florida, just to let you know, I mean, DEP has all this information uh, listed on their website, but we actually have, more impaired water bodies here in Florida at this point than we do outstanding Florida waters. Um, and, 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 and that's a result of, I mean, not only all the development that we've had here, 
Um, but I mean, even even like the the uh, the housing developments, you know, examples high nutrient loadings as a result of overuse of, of fertilizers. Um, that's why most government agencies have established ordinances limiting the use of fertilizers. Um, so, uh, you know, just, just all the development, extra pollution. And, I mean, then we have, like, really big issues going on, too. For example, um, Lake Okeechobee. I mean, that's one of the most polluted lakes in Florida. And, mm. it, it, you know, it wasn't that way 30 years ago. The Everglades is a huge restoration project, and <clears throat> I mean, I don't know if they're ever going to fix that. I mean, <laughs> at least not in my lifetime. Right. But um, yeah, so I mean, we um, oh, and we also have we have red tide now too for longer periods of time, in a number of different areas. Um, so I mean, that's not only an environmental problem for us; it's also an economic problem too. I mean, really, you know, who's going to want to live in Florida or visit Florida? If we have red tide all year round and if all of our water bodies are, are filled with green slime. So. Right. Do you think some of those changes can be linked to an insufficient stormwater knowledge, wh- whether it's in the culture or the populace or um, in the industry? Oh, most certainly. I mean, um, most people don't realize pollution if they can't see it. Um or if they can't see the effects. I mean, when the Clean Water was was uh, Clean Water Act was passed, the pollution was highly visible. Um, but now, stormwater pollution is uh, a lot different. But um, but I mean, I I you know we have education programs, or the cities and the counties do public education programs, um, which you know we can we can talk about. But um, but you know, watching the news after a storm has come through is disturbing. I mean, mm-hmm. people people go out and let their kids go out and play in the, the floodwaters. And, you know, that's polluted runoff. And <laughs> I, I sit and, and I watch and I'm, I'm totally shocked. But, you know, it's just that it's the misconception. They just they they think it's clean water and they don't mm-hmm. realize what's in that water. So are there any situations where... Um, a proper stormwater education program or something like that in stormwater leads to better water, water, excuse me, leads to better water quality or just generally speaking, a a cleaner environment for Floridians. Um, Yes. I mean, actually like with the cities and the counties under their MS4 permit um, and that is one of the minimum requirements that they're supposed to have a public education an outreach program about stormwater pollution, and they're also supposed to have a public participation pr- participation and involvement program. So um, examples are like posting flyers at homeowners' doors um, about stormwater pollution, or developing um, specific brochures, you know, for different best management practices to be used for like the different businesses that they have in their area. Mm-hmm. Um, putting up signs, that's a good idea to yeah. prohibit dumping. I mean, I don't know why we need a sign for that, but, <laughs> but yeah. I guess you know, some, some people do. Um, Pinellas County, which I'm right across the bay from, um, from Pinellas County, uh, they were actually sending me pictures. They had to put together some special, um, special brochures educating people not to put their rubber gloves and their mask down into the storm inlets. Oh, boy. And... Yeah, so that that was pretty surprising and and pretty just kind of sad at the same time. But I'm like, you know, why? I mean, I was taught that it was horrible just to throw a a gum wrapper on the ground. But you know, yeah. it needs to it needs to start the earlier it starts, <laughs> then I think the more effective it's going to be. But I mean, you know, in Florida, we have new businesses coming in all the time, or businesses that change hands. We I mean, we certainly have. Um, new residents coming in all the time. So any anybody that I know that runs a public education program for a city or a county, it's it's definitely a full-time job for them. I mean, they're just constantly out there <laughs> having to talk over and over again, you know, you know many times mm-hmm. to the, the same organizations just because there's new people there. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, masks and rubber gloves down a storm drain, that's a new one. I haven't heard that one before, mm-hmm. but... Um, is there 
is there something specific to Florida where you, you feel like other states might not have to deal with this type of stormwater education or stormwater knowledge? Well, I mean, I, I kind of, I think that uh, probably a lot of other states are, you know, they're using the storm drain stenciling and that's a great idea. You know, letting right. people know only rain down the drain or, or when you, you know, mark them drains to lake or river or ocean, then that kind of um, drives the point home. But um, uh, public participation, I mean, that, that's a great idea to get volunteer groups you know, involved to help out. Um, I mean, over here we have Tampa Bay Watch and they coordinate beach cleanup days and they put on, you know, exhibits in, in different, you know, types of, of settings at, you know, different like um, public um, exhibit halls and things like that. So, um, yes. And was, did that answer your question? <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Um, okay. Okay. So I kind of want to um, cycle back to the generic permit. Um, so as I was reviewing it, I did look over it a little bit before, uh, our podcast and one part of the permits language that I found, um, most revealing was there's a very big emphasis on uncontaminated waters. Um, what kind of discretion do you encourage a contractor or a general contractor or a subcontractor to use to ensure that they're only discharging um, uncontaminated waters? Hmm. Uncon uh, uncontaminated. <laughs> that that is a that, that's a very broad term. Um, and let's see. I I would rather. I think it'd be easier to ask the question. What is what what is not um, <laughs> uncontaminated? So um, all right. Basically, it's um, clean water being used for dust control. Uh, that would be uh, uncontaminated. Uh, uncontaminated groundwater, uh, which uh, that is mapped out on the FDEP website. Um, on what's called their um, contamination locator map and institutional controls registry. So for de dewatering applications, if it is non-contaminated groundwater, then you are allowed to release that off the site. I mean, mm. dust control. I mean, that should be okay too, as long as as long as you're, the water that you're using for dust control doesn't have any type of, of sediment or turbidity in it, which would, you know, kind of be doubtful in my mind. But, um, but that's, I mean, that's the way it's worded as non-contaminated. So basically it's th those two, um, <laughs> two activities or categories. Um, if you look at, and I also teach uh, on illicit discharge detection and elimination. So basically anything other than clean water is considered to be an illicit discharge in the, the eyes of the government. Mm -hmm. Except for, uh, there are some exemptions. So uh, water water used for for firefighting, that's exempt. Air conditioned condensation, residential irrigation water, also um, non chlorinated pool water, um, that's that's on the list of exemptions too. Um, so anything else is considered to be con contaminated. You know, soaps, solvents concrete wash water paint any type of chemical substance trash debris sediment um, turbidity are all considered to be uh, contamination yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't have considered soaps to be part of that but I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out right it's, thought, it, oh, you yeah. know it's just yeah ba yeah ba yeah so again <laughs> basically anything other than clean storm water if there is such a thing is is yes is not allowable yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of the reason why I like doing this podcast is because there's things that like uh, my first experience learning about storm water was going, oh, like something that goes down a storm drain isn't untreated or it, it isn't treated. Right. Like it usually just goes straight to a water body or something like exactly. that was a weird thing for me to learn. And this is just another one where it's like, oh, soaps. I mean, it totally makes sense that that would be considered an illicit discharge. But it's like, what? No, not soap. It cleans the water. Right, right. No, yeah, it's just it. Well, I mean, there there's some biodegradable types, but um, right. But there's well, 
And I mean, there's the problem too that you know a lot of the a lot of the substances cleaners and things like that that we're using now. I mean, EPA they haven't even set standards for those and what sort of effect that they're going to have uh, on our water quality or on an, on the environment. So, um, so that's a problem. You know, we're we're just kind of EPA is kind of trying to play catch up now <laughs> to to all of those new. Uh, I mean, even like pharmaceuticals and things like that. I mean, there, there's there's so much to consider. Um, mm. I mean, we have the whole what's called the TMDL program, which stands for Total Maximum Daily Load Program, where you have to actually test the stormwater for um, parts per million for different types of substances. But a lot of the substances that you know we're we're uh, actively using on a day-to-day basis, they're not even part of that list because EPA doesn't have the capabilities to uh, to test for them yet, or or maybe they do have, but we're just we're still battling those pollutants, yeah. those known pollutants um, that we can address. Yeah, well, it is a it is a constant struggle to try and keep our environment clean and to keep our you know our drinking water and our planet clean, but uh, we are coming a little bit close to our target time here. So if uh, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of imparting advice, what do you think that would be? Okay. I mean, you know, I think that if, I mean, if everyone just took this seriously, not only at work, but at home too, I mean, we could all do simple things, you know, disposing and storing items properly, uh, taking certain items for recycling and, and using, you know, drop-off points, not using fertilizers during the rainy season or having a, a buffer zone, you know, for those who live on waterfront property. I mean, that would be a, a great start. Um, I mean, we only have one planet, so <laughs> we need to yeah. do our, our best to try to protect it. Yeah. Despite the, uh, the efforts of Elon Musk, I don't think we're going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl, for being on. Um, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they you know, have any questions or maybe want to, to work with you? Okay. Um, all of my information, I, my, my website address is um, floridastormwater.com. So my contact information, my telephone number, which is my cell phone number, um, I'm, you know, you can always reach me there or I'll call you back if I'm teaching a training class. Um, and then I have the, you know, the, the training class schedule, my email address and, and information is there too. So floridastormwater.com, uh, that's, that's going to be the easiest way I can tell you. So. Mm-hmm. Well, wonderful. All right. Well, thanks for being a part of the Saving Stormwater podcast. Uh, for everybody listening today, make sure to check out Compliance Go. Um, there's a lot of parts to the construction or the generic construction permit that we talked about today that can be addressed by Compliance Go, um, and they can make it really easy for contractors, general contractors, subcontractors, um, and even on the MS4 side, or if you're an environmental consultant who does inspections, I think it'd be a great way to get started. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. And uh, thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.